Monet Hates Me was designed as an exhibition in a box with original material in the Getty Research Institute where you were artists in residence from 2014 to 2015. The 50 objects in the artist edition were designed and produced by you and Martin Ridgewell. Tell us about the title, Monet Hates Me. Okay, so when I was an artist in residence here, you know, you're invited as a scholar, even though you're an artist. And so you're asked for your scholarly uh, project, which as an artist, I didn't have one, obviously. <laughs> so I came up with the idea of a sort of an unconscious search, um, because obviously research is usually people are trying to search for something. The title of my project was The Importance of Objective Chance as a Tool of Research. As an artist, I work with that quite often. I'm very open to chance intervention. You know, interested in sort of the non-deliberate act and things that happen that are uninvited. So I decided to come here and do start with this idea of not having an idea. You know, this was 2014. I just literally pointed to some box on a sort of quite high up and I said, that one and he dutifully got up on a ladder took it down and in it in this box which was the um, Malvina Hoffman papers was the literally the key to Auguste Rodin's studio in Paris it was just an incredible first object to come across and you know after that there was another box with a lock of his hair and and various other things and and I started just collecting things sometimes it wasn't you know done in that way it was done by looking over people's shoulders in special collections or you know, things people told me or... Um, so I just did this and over more than just a singular year, over a few years, I kind of accumulated a lot of photographs and objects and things. You know, one of the other things I did at the Getty was reframing the future of film and trying to um, make sure we don't lose photochemical film and photography as a means of expression for artists. So I asked John Kiffey, who's the photographer in residence here, to take a, f a five by four negatives of every object that I'd, you know, I'd encountered, which he did. So there's this huge collection of, uh, which I had made into prints. It kind of accumulated from there because I, I think the Getty was beginning to encourage the, the artists, which I would further encourage, the artists to do something with their year here. And, um, you know, and the idea was to make an artist book and I extended it to make a, an edition and um, because I wanted it to be loose things and then it, it grew into this idea of making it a, a sort of more like an exhibition in a box you know so you could have this box and and be able to have quite a comprehensive work rather than a, a singular work but I never got round to it because it was just such an epic amount of work mm -hmm. originally it was 50 objects they would all be random you know there would be no order you know as a pr proposal I had to go back to Berlin in 2019 because of Brexit and being British. But we didn't leave LA completely, so it was like having, keeping one foot here. But by the time I left, I'd only man managed to make one of my 50 objects, which was this George Brecht stamp, which was called Stamp Out Stamping. And we stamped it once, and then twice on another card, three times on another card, four times, and so on. That was the only object I managed <laughs> to do prior to leaving. And then there was a, a, an idea of making it more um, with Walter and, and Franz Koenig, so it would be more commercially produced that, you know, that they would produce it more. And, and then the pandemic happened. Ma Martin Ridgewell is a, was at art school with me. He's a very, very old friend of mine. M he got into computers way before anyone else. And we, he started to help me with things that I wanted to make, like a facsimile of a newspaper back in 1994. So I started to Skype with him. We started to make the objects alone. You know, I was in Berlin in my studio, you know, in lockdown. He was in Cornwall in England. And we started to, instead of you know, doing what we had intended to do, I started making them myself, and he made them himself. And we worked with whatever people who were small producers who were open still or had free time suddenly, you know, like somebody who could make etching, somebody who could do a screen print, you know, found someone who would make a postage stamp. Um, I hand wrote Dear Father Hitler out this letter a hundred times. You know, I cut out paper. You know, I just, before I left, I, I bought all this vintage papers. I mean, just, I'd said by vintage, like 1970s uh, sort of paper, maybe 1950, 1960. I bought a whole lot from a guy I met in the Rose Bowl. Very difficult to find old paper, but I had this paper, thankfully, and so I was cutting it all out. I mean, and, you know, meanwhile, everyone, you know, the atmosphere, the beginning of lockdown is that sense that you were going to do something or you were either in hell 
so you had to find a new way of, of working and, and there was this so I started to do make the objects with Martin for Monet hates me it just became it transformed it became something else much more homemade so anyway one of the objects I found well was this letter to Pizarro Camille Pizarro from Claude Monet at the end it just really looks like it says hate Tacita <laughs> Claude Monet and I remember photographing it on my iPhone at the time, thinking, ha ha, Monet hates me. <laughs> and so at a certain point, that became the title. That's why it's called Monet Hates Me. Now you have also, uh, you mentioned it already, but you have a title for the research project called The Importance of Objective Chance as a Tool of Research. What the Getty does to its artists, which I think is quite interesting, is they want them to be scholars. We're not, we're dysfunctional scholars. So you cannot come without your uh, a project title. A research title. So that's the one I came up with. Uh -huh. <laughs> so there are 50 objects. Um, this is object number one. It has the key. It has Rodin's key yeah. on it. That's literally the scale of it. The key to his studio. Object number one. It's also what is signed. So this it only exists a hundred times, this book. Yeah, this has all the objects in it. And it's all also the means by which you can put the objects back in the box because it's a guide to that. So object number one goes there, and then object number two is uh, Piet Mondrian's business card. So you know that that goes next into the box. Then object number three is this uh, photograph, upside down photograph of it, as we made into a Polaroid. That goes on top of the, you know, so it's also yeah. a guide to how to put the objects back in the box. So it's all in here. Are they thematically related? Uh, no. Yeah. Random Just research. A bit yeah. yeah, nothing. The, the only connective thread is me and the moment of finding them. Yeah. But there are also um, fragments, seems to me, if I recall correctly. So what draws you to the fragment? The fragment can represent the whole or a version of the whole or a new version of the whole, I guess. You mm. know, it's all a reinvention. Do you include a page from a late 18th century book, Museum Britannicum, displaying the collection of Sir, H Sir Hans Sloan? whose collection formed the origin of the British Museum. What drew you to that, to the idea of the museum in its relationship to this project? I mean, the Museum Britannicum is a, full of the most fabulous engravings of esoteric objects, but they're objects that we would all find in our lives, you know, anomalous, weird, esoteric kind of curiosities, like a, a, a ball of fur from the gut of an ox, of an ox or uh, the horn of a, a horned woman from Kent, mm. you know, things like that that are broken off. I mean, weird things, but they're all drawn in a sort of, so they're already gone through a remove of artistic process because they're, they're drawn uh, and engraved in this thing. And, they're, and I was just, I loved this, these objects. I thought they were extraordinary because they were strange representations of, of you know, what was a, 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 a museum object, actually. What about Ruskin and his clouds? Well, clouds took me to Ruskin. I mean, a fascinating man, John Ruskin. Madman, in a way. Madman, um, but he was a weather watcher. I read this book by Brian Dillon called Suppose a Sentence, re you know, that came out last year. It was a wonderful little book where he concentrates on one sentence from R Ruskin's uh, paper, the you know, Clouds of the 19th Century. He was documenting the weather, which, you know, did in a way erode his senses. Um, and he was, uh, you know, against technology. And, you know, he, he stood, you know, he was what we call a Luddite in a way. But um, in the end, you know, his documenting of the shift, shifting in the nature of clouds and the colour and density of clouds and the dirty, is the dirtifying of clouds, in fact, is actually quite accurate to the advent of the industrialization of of the Midlands in England. So in, in a way he was, I call him as a, a cloud Cassandra, <laughs> but nobody, not even himself, took it seriously. Now David Hockney suggested that you look into the Gettys collection of the Prague-born art historian Heinrich Schwartz. Well, it was just such a perfect collection of a, a scholar, because he kept everything obsessively. He was a, a, a man very interested, like David, in, in optics, actually. And, um, and in optical devices. He had every sort of optical device available. You know, photographs of them. And I mean, he was a huge well of information, like silhouettes and, and so on and so forth. So I thank David for 
sending me in that direction. And I only dip my, you know, went into one of the first few boxes because it, it was too enormous. But it really is a beautiful kind of portrait of a scholar from the middle of the last century, I think. Yeah. Object 11 is a foot-long strip co of Kodak 35 millimeter stock of human feet. Describe, describe well, uh, it pictures of human feet. Pictures <laughs> of human feet. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get that right. <laughs> Here, this is Object 11. It's a, it's a, well, a foot in a film is 16 frames. A 35 millimeter foot is 16 frames. So I call this a foot of, a foot of feet. So they're all feet, many of the feet I found. I mean, this is something I did later. It's not something when I was in searching in the collection, I wasn't looking for feet. It was only when I, when I in, in this period when I'm locked down, when I, I had the idea about one or, you know, about five or six of objects, but the other, the others I didn't know what I was going to do. The idea was to make every single one of it on a different material or surface or medium. So I thought, well, I should make a strip of film. And so then it became a foot of feet. So it's just a strip of, uh, a strip of film. Mm. So everything is made differently. Every p there, there's no two objects are the same. Penis in the bedroom. This is on this um, phototechnical film, which is beautiful. Um, trans translucent black and white film. You can't get this anymore. We had to eventually, we found some guy in Prague who made it. But I mean, it's always like, I was looking for this material for other work of mine, and then I, th I thought, well, I should use it for this. It's a double expo found double exposure, just in a, in a rejected file of miscellanea from the Shunk Kender archive. So it was a mistake. So I mean, when you say fragments, I am attracted to mistakes. So which are sort of fragments, in, way, yeah. in a way. One last object in it, object number 13, which is a handwritten letter from Daniel Ewing Greenberg to his father, the influential art critic Clement Greenberg, written during the Second World War. Maybe you could read it for us. I mean, it's a really poignant letter, and it's an object that has uh, two parts. So it's got the, the letter from Danny to his father, and then there's this, the first two pages of this dream that uh, called a dream that uh, Greenberg w wrote, and I found them together in the same. They were undated, um, so the the letter, and I wrote this out, copied it out a hundred times, and it became very symptomatic of my lockdown use of time that I was writing. You know, friends were making paintings, and I was writing, "Dear Father Hitler." It's written from Carmel in on April the sixth. And what's beautiful about it is this, so it's caps, you know, dear father. And then obviously his mother has written in cursive, Hitler. <laughs> so he's written, dear father Hitler and his men will soon be overpowered someday and the Japs too, but hope you are having a nice, and then the other side is time down there, love Danny, I think. That's what it says. Were there many personal letters kept by Greenberg in, in his uh, archive? And no, the answer is no, not to my knowledge, not to in the bit where I, f I looked. But I did find this dream, and this dream is a wonderful, I mean, a quite extraordinary dream about him dreaming that he attends the execution of Adolf Hitler. And we had this typed on a vintage typewriter mm -hmm. a hundred times, and there's, it's recto verso. You know, that's, that's what I meant about the, we're investing time in, in taking time making these objects.